how much our ideas of work have changed in the last few years. If you ask uh, young people today what they aspire to be in their vocation, you'll get things like, I wanna be a uh, YouTube channel host and go viral. Um, that's much different than generations ago. If you grew up on a farm, then those young people growing up on that farm would just aspire to be farmers. Or if your parents you know, were uh, coal miners or steel workers, then that was your lot. Uh, in fact, if you go back to even the ancient times of the New Testament, that was typically how you would look at your vocation. Whatever your family trade was, that is the place you would go. But with this advent of technology and the internet, now you have um, people who don't work in factories. They don't work among peers in person. Um, so much of work today is virtual. And so the peers you have are virtual. They're just people and faces that you might see on a Zoom screen. Yesterday, I was on a, a six hour long Zoom meeting. I know, that was a long time, but that was the best that we could do in the circumstances. That was all that we could do with Omicron going on. So, so the interactions that we have are confined to these little boxes now that we see, but you see the difference. There's a virtual presence that is now our workspace versus a, an actual physical location where we are actually in person with colleagues. So if you were a steel mill worker, then many of your friendships would develop as you were working alongside people. And, and if you're a coal mine worker, or if you're a farmer or whatever your trade was, you were in a place and in a place you would work alongside people and you would be a worker in a community. That's different now. Today, you could be sitting in your home through the whole week, having these virtual peers that you are seeing in these little boxes, these little windows. And so that has affected greatly our understanding of work, our understanding of, of our purpose in work. And for example, unions. Unions used to be very important in our country. But now you have people who shift from one job to another where unions were there to help you solidify a long-term career in one place, one company. Well, nowadays people are shifting back and forth. We don't take roots in our companies anymore. And so there's this lack of relationship. There's a lack of place. There's a lack of roots. Um, the place of your employment, if you are in a space, it feels like you see people come and go. It's like, it's like going camping. Like you go camping on a campground and you see some people come in their trailers and then they're gone. And, and that's, what, that's what work has become. Um, so it's less relational, it's less interpersonal. And at the same time, there is a greater desire to do meaningful work. More now than ever, there's young people who want to do work that is meaningful. Now, what they mean by meaningful is I want to do work that is satisfying or fulfilling. And so oftentimes you see people who start their jobs and um, you, you ask them, so how's your job going? And they say, oh, I just want to leave. Uh, I just don't feel like I'm fulfilled here. Or I don't feel appreciated here. And uh, you ask them how long you've been on the job, and they're oh, about six months. Six months, and do you want to leave? And that's that's the attitude towards work now. It's I want to work so that it makes me feel fulfilled. That's more and more um, prominent now. So you have less interpersonal relationships, less rootedness, less community in work, while at the same time a greater desire for meaningful work. And so you can understand the frustration that exists now in the workplace because of all of these factors today. Add the pandemic to this, you see this kind of almost casual nature of work, right? People are showing up in their, you know, they've got blazers up top, boxers below, right? It's, it's you show up to work in your, in your sweats. Um, you know, joggers are about as formal as it gets now if you are going to work. 
So all of this, all of this has created this mindset towards work that is in large part in contradiction to the Lord's understanding of work. What the scriptures say about work is quite the opposite of the trend. Work is actually very relational. That is what work is intended to be. That when we go to work, we don't just go to work and produce things or get a paycheck, but we go to work in the context of friendships, in the context of, of co-workers and relationships. This is how the Lord shapes our understanding of work. So your bottom line is not how many sales did I get or how many projects did I complete or how many successful sales did I you know, meet. It's not how many dollars did I bring into the company. In the Lord's mind, the bottom line is relationships. When it comes to work, that's the bottom line. So when we, when we go into this text and we see how the Lord wants us to relate with one another, we see that that's where the value is. The value is how do masters and slaves relate to one another and work together in the context of relationships? So now first, the disclaimer, right? Slaves Masters, what is the Bible talking about here? Are, is it sanctioning slavery? So if you, I'm sure you all remember that this is part two of this passage. We went through this passage back in November. I'm sure it's fresh in your minds when we did the disclaimer on how uh, the Bible addresses slavery. And we talked about slavery in the United States. There is a contrast between first century Greco-Roman slavery with American chattel slavery in the South. And we talked about those contrasts. Uh, the contrast in first century, uh, slavery was not based on race. It wasn't based on the color of your skin. You didn't necessarily grow into it or were born into slavery. In, in first century Greco-Roman, some slaves had rights and freedoms. Many slaves developed trades, professions. There were accountants who were slaves. There were, there were a lot of opportunities for some slaves. At the same time, there is a lot of similarities. There was oppression. There are people who died on, in slavery because of the oppression of slavery in the first century. And so there was a lot of similarities as well. So if you say, well, hey, why are we talking about workplace when we're talking about a very oppressive institution of slavery? If Paul can say to a slave and to a master that you work unto a higher master, even under an oppressive institution like slavery, then certainly these principles would apply to you in a less oppressive workplace that you're living in, right? You, you can take these principles under a very oppressive institution and you are still called to live these out under a less oppressive institution that you're working in, right? So this is what we do. We, we're going to take these principles that Paul lays out, and we're going to apply them to our workplaces, okay? So how does this address the issue of slavery? If we look at what Paul lays out as principles for how we are to work in the workplace and how slaves and masters are to treat each other, then the Bible is undermining the very institution of slavery from within. Meaning that if Paul is advocating that slaves and masters treat each other as equals, who have equal dignity, equal worth, then that treatment, if slaves and masters treat each other that way, then you're going to unravel slavery from the get-go because owners and masters, they were owners and masters because they could do violence. They could control. Paul is taking that tool out of master's hands and saying, nope, you have no right to treat your brother, your sister, who is a slave with violence or aggression. You have no right to do that. So once you take that tool away, you are taking away the very thing that holds slavery together. 
And if we look at the history of, of slavery in the Roman time, we see that this undermining of slave relations to masters and masters to slaves is what unraveled slavery in first century Rome, Roman Empire. Okay. So that's the disclaimer on slavery. Can we go to the workplace? Let's go to the workplace. When we go to the workplace, there are a couple of principles. One is, the first principle is this, you have a new boss. If you were an unbeliever and you held this job and then you became a believer holding the same job, then you may have the same boss in your company, but you have a whole new boss. Your new boss is Jesus Christ. That's the first principle. Your new boss is Jesus. You have a whole new HR department. You have a whole new performance evaluation criteria. Everything is new when now you become a Christian because now in Christ, you have a new boss. His name is Jesus and he's the king of the universe and he's your master. So slaves, it says in verse five, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. And if you're wondering about Masters, same thing, verse 9. You know that he who is both their master, slave's master, and your master is in heaven. Masters and slaves, you have a new boss. So if you're an employer, if you're an employee, you serve a whole new CEO, a whole new president of your company, a whole new boss, a new supervisor. His name is Jesus. So when you have a new master, you, your work is now part of a bigger story. Your work is part of a bigger story. An example I think I've shared before is when builders were on the construction site of St. Paul's Cathedral in London centuries ago, a reporter came and asked these workers, what are you doing here? One worker replied, well, I'm just preparing these this stone to sit on top of this stone. Okay, next worker, what are you doing here? I'm just earning a paycheck, trying to make a living, pay the bills. Goes to the third worker, what are you doing here? And that worker said, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren build St. Paul's Cathedral. See the difference? One sees their work just for utilitarian means, selfish means. Um, one sees their work as part of a bigger story. I am helping Sir Christopher Wren build St. Paul's Cathedral. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and you think about what your boss expects of you tomorrow, don't think about your supervisor in your company. Don't think about whoever is on the hierarchy above you. Don't think about your boss or your CEO. You think, Jesus, what do you want me to do for you today? What are the tasks that you have for me today? Because he's your new boss. He's your new boss. And he's the one that you are accountable to, all right? Monday morning, tomorrow morning, that's who you wake up to, Jesus. What do you want me to do, Lord? Second principle, second principle you have new measures. How many of you have ever been in a performance review where you are evaluated for your annual work? Anyone? You raise your hand if you've been in a performance review. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So you know the usual measures, they, the, the ways that they evaluate you. Jesus has some new ones. He's got some new ones for you. Here, are how, here is how you are measured. Number one, how do you respect others? How do you respect others? Not just your coworkers, but your customers. Do you treat everyone with respect? Paul instructs the slaves to obey their earthly masters with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling, as you would Jesus. Wow. As you would Jesus. He tells the bosses to do the same. Verse 9, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. So what we see here are you have people who are high up on the totem pole, people making the, the biggest amount of money in your company, and then you've got people making little to nothing. They are equal. They are equal. 
in Christ, right? It says in Galatians, there's no Jew nor Greek. And then it says, there's no slave nor, nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. So we treat our bosses, we treat those on lowest on the totem pole equally with equal respect. So just think, you're in your workplace, the CEO comes into your office and think of the ways that you would just automatically have an honor, a deference, a respect for your CEO. Well, now imagine the janitor comes into your office. You are to have the same respect and deference and treatment of the janitor as you would the CEO of that company. Do you treat everyone with equal respect? That's what we are to do. We are evaluated based on how we treat one another equally. And so we're not trying to kiss up to the CEO or kiss up to the, to the, our bosses or our supervisors. We, we don't do that. And we don't demean those who are not making uh, as much as we are in our office. None of that matters. All are one in Christ Jesus. Every person is made in the image of God. So even if you're not believers, you are looking at someone who is a fellow image bearer and bears the very image of God, and therefore they have value and significance and worth, and we're to treat each other that way. Number two, you're going to be evaluated on how invested you are in your work. How invested are you in your work? Verse, verse six says, obey them, that's your, your masters, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your what? From your heart. Do the will of God from your heart. So you're bringing your whole heart into your work. I don't know if you're a fan of the show, The Office. Um, you know what I'm talking about? The Office. The, the Office is really set up on this premise that everyone is just playing a role just to manipulate one another. Um, they're not really into it. They're not invested. They're less, and because of that, they're less than honest. They do less than what they can in their work. They're just trying to get by. That is not work that's from the heart. Work that's from the heart. When you bring your, your heart to your work, you do all of your work with excellence. But not, it's not just about the work. You treat other people with love. When you bring your heart to work, you're bringing your heart to see the needs of your coworker, to see the needs of customers. You see them and with your heart. That's what happens when you bring your heart to work. You value people, you value their needs. And so you're gonna start to see their needs. And then you start to say, how can I meet those needs? That's what we do when we're invested. When we are fully invested, we're not just saying, how can I get by and get a paycheck? When we're fully invested, we're saying, how can I love my coworkers and love my customers well? Um, one of my first jobs is working at uh, the Christian bookstore. And so in a Christian bookstore over in Daly City, you start to, yeah, you may, if you remember, you know, behind a counter, there was this, you know, uh, brown skinny kid um, behind the counter who may have like, you know, sold you a Bible or something. That was me. So, so in that position, I learned that every person who comes through that door, I need to treat as if they were Jesus. I need to welcome them, honor them, try to meet their needs as if they were Jesus. So the things that I would do down to the littlest things, if I was to make a, a, uh, for a sale sign, you know, those, the signs that you see where they have the prices on the product and a little description, I would make those signs. And my boss would, who, who saw me make those signs, she, she really thought I did a really good job with those because I did those as if Jesus was going to come into that bookstore and um, buy that Bible, which is kind of a weird thing to think about, you know, why would Jesus buy a Bible? But that's, that was the approach that I took with every sign. So she would always have me do the signs, um, the ways that I would engrave a Bible, with the, you know, how you can get your name on a Bible. I would do that. I, and part of my problem with that, I took so much time um, on it while people were waiting. But I took so much time because I wanted it to be just right. I wanted it to be as if I was doing it for Jesus himself. 
I learned that in the Christian bookstore. And by learning that, I saw there's so many wonderful Christians that came through that door that I got to serve. And to this day, I still have a reverence for Christians who live in this city because I saw and served them. And I could see that Sunday school teacher who was just coming in week after week and week after week, wanting their, her kids to just know Jesus. And I just had such a deference and a respect for that person that I wanted that, that Sunday school teacher to feel honored because of who they were. And that shows up in how we treat people, how we, how we love people and how we can identify what, what do you really need? How can I really help you? What are you looking for? And so you take the extra time to find out where, where can I order that thing? If we don't have it, how can I get it? You know, that kind of approach is invested. I learned that just by working in that bookstore. But that's the kind of approach we need to have in our workplaces where people feel like, you know what? Because Linda is in my workspace, I know that she sees my needs. I know. She knows what I'm struggling with. I don't even have to share them. She knows just by the way I look. She looks at my face. She can tell because she's invested. That's what we are to be to one another, to our workplaces. Okay? How invested are you? So that shows up in how you treat others, but it also shows up in your work, doesn't it? Uh, the Shakers were a community of people who, who lived in colonial America and in the a few centuries ago, like the Quakers, there were the Shakers. The Shakers were known for their furniture and how they did their furniture. And one of the trademarks of how they did furniture was that if they made a chair, that the, the handiwork of, of the chair in the seats and the arms and the backing would be beautifully done. But if you looked underneath that chair, it would also be beautifully done. Beautiful craftsmanship, beautiful handiwork. Why? Because Shakers understood this principle about how they worked, that no matter what I do in my work, I work as unto the Lord. And the Lord, people may not see the bottom of this chair, but the Lord sees the bottom of this chair. So I'm going to do my work as unto him because he sees the bottom of this chair. That's the attitude that we're to bring into our work treating and working, treating others as if they were Jesus, working on whatever we are doing as if we are doing it as unto Jesus. So we're bringing care and love to customers and coworkers. We're bringing excellence to our work. Why? Because we work for a higher master, for Jesus. The third thing, criteria, how you love. How well do you love? Serve wholeheartedly, verse 7, it says, as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do. When you think about good, what is good in the scriptures? Good is, is our ability to reflect the goodness of the Lord to one another. Right? So the goodness, goodness is a trait of the Holy, a fruit of the Holy Spirit right? Goodness. What is that? Goodness is just, how do I express the goodness of God? And that's always in relational terms. It's always in how we love people. So whatever good we do, that is um, how we can best display the goodness of God in our work to others through our good works. That's what we're to do. We're to major on developing relationships with people in our workplace through our loving deeds, through our loving deeds. So do you genuinely care for your coworkers? Or do you see them as resources? Or do you see them as people who are in, in the way of your career path? How, how do you see your, your coworkers? Or do you even care about your coworkers? Or are you just only concerned about your profession? You being the worker you can be, or the the writer you can be, or the salesperson you can be, or uh, whatever it is that you can be? Are you only confining yourself to see your work based on what you can do? Um, if you've ever seen the movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, um, it has this romantic um, kind of view, this man who wants to succeed as a musician, and he tries to be um, successful and compose a famous 
symphony. And he's kind of frustrated, um, but he gets married, settles down and becomes a music teacher at a school. And he doesn't do well. He doesn't do well at first. But the school director just continues to stress the importance of teaching music to these kids. And so he dives into it and he helps struggling kids in learning how to make music well. But he also has an autistic son. And this autistic son who he struggled to connect with, he finally succeeds by saying, I'm gonna put my roots down in my family and I'm gonna invest in my son and work on my struggling marriage. And as he does that, he starts realizing and his vocational calling is to help others, to help others in love. Once he settled into the community that was his family, then he could start to express his calling and his gifting in the community that he was in. And this is the same for us that we are to find our roots in a community that we work with so that we can then express the gifts that we have in that community and help others, build others up. So that's the kind of care and investment that we're to bring, not just to focus on how do I develop professionally in my own profession, but how can I love the people that God has placed in my workplace and use the gifts that I have for their betterment? That's, that's got to be our, our bottom line. Our bottom line, again, is relationships. How well do you love the people that God has put around you? If you're a supervisor then you, and you've got a team of people, and I remember having conversations with, uh, uh, you remember Orlando, Orlando Leon. He used to be a supervisor over at UCSF, and we'd have this conversation as he would uh, lead his team and he would see his team and he would put the value on the relationships that he had with his team. And so you have relationships in your team and you can look at those relationships, right? The, if you've got four other people in your team, you can look at each relationships, relationship that you have. But there's something else that you ought to look at too. And that's the relationships that the teammates have with each other. And you have a role to play in how those relationships go too. You can be someone who fosters peace, who can be a gentle hand, who can help be a listening board so that those relationships can develop as well. So we're not just responsible for the relationships we have individually with people, but also how can we be a peacemaker with, with others in our workplace? Or, or how can we help other people understand other teammates so that their relationships can grow as well. So when we think about how we love one another, it's not just the relationships I have, but it's the relationships they have because we have a role to play as well. So we can train people to look out for each other. We can train people to better listen to each other, better understand each other. That's how we can help foster um, teamwork and um, relationships on our team. That's a role that we have to play as well. All right. Lastly, the last measure here is how you witness. Jesus has placed you in your team, your workplace, in your job, because he has you as a kingdom representative right there. You are an outpost of the kingdom of God in your workplace because you are part of a larger story. Your story is part of the kingdom story. And so you're bringing your kingdom outlook into your workplace. And so we witness, we witness, we do good. And this is where we understand that our bottom line, again, it's not about dollars and cents. It's about people's souls. It's about people's relationships with God. So when we find opportunity, we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot, there's a lot to be said about how we do that. There are, uh, we, we pray. One of, the first thing you do, do you pray for the souls of those you work with? Do you pray for your coworkers that they may come to know the Lord? Um, praying is a big part of how we witness. And then when we pray, 
we can ask the Lord, Lord, give me an opportunity, right? And so we can find those opportunities. But again, this goes back to, do you see your coworkers as just coworkers or are they incidental to your professional development? Or do you see them as, as those that God has entrusted to you, entrusted to you to model Jesus and to share the good news of Jesus when there's an opportunity? When they see the way that you work, they ought to be able to say, give me a reason for the hope that you have. Give me a reason for it. Give me a reason why you treat our boss with such respect when he's sometimes he's a slimy, shady, you know, we're, we're not exempt, right? We're not exempt from treating uh, bosses who are not always acting in integrity, let's say to be diplomatic, we're not exempt from also treating them with respect. We're to treat everyone with respect. If we can treat someone who treats us wrongly with respect, then someone's going to say, give me a reason. Give me a reason for why you do that. Why would you treat that person with respect when they gossip about you or they slander you in the workplace or they won't give you that promotion for whatever reason? Why is it that you still treat that person with respect? It's because you serve a higher master. Now you've got an opportunity to share about who this Jesus is. So these are the criteria. When you sit down before the Lord and he rewards you for the good work you do in your workplace, he's going to give you these measures and evaluate you. And you will be asked, how did you respect other people? How invested were you in your work? How did you love the people that I put into your lives? And how did you witness? How did you witness? So I just don't, I want us to bring this to our minds. For some of you, this is not new at all, um, but it is a reminder. Some of you, this is new. This isn't how you've seen work. You, no one told you that this is how to go about the workplace. For you, career was just, you know, how do you fulfill the American dream? That's all career ever was. But in the Lord's paradigm, for you, you serve him, and you've been placed in your workplace as an outpost of his kingdom. You're part of a larger story. I, so what are you doing there? What are you doing in your workplace? Why are you there? I'm here to make a paycheck. I'm here to pay the bills. Or I'm here to develop my artisanship or develop my professional skills. Oh, I'm here as a stepping stone onto a better job. Or I'm here because I am helping Jesus Christ build his kingdom. We need to be reminded who our master really is. Serve God or serve money. You can't serve both, right? You can't serve both, Jesus said. Who is our master? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus um, oftentimes as a church, we, we focus on church stuff. We, we focus on the work we can do in ministry. But Lord, you have scattered us in workplaces to be salt and light, to develop relationships, to connect with others, to bring you to people. So Lord, right now we want to just think about the networks that you have placed us in the people that we're going to see tomorrow morning, whether it's virtually or in person. Lord, we pray that you will help us to have your eyes, your heart, your desire that none should perish, just beating in our hearts, that we would see them as those made in your image and we would value them, respect them. Lord, we pray for opportunities, Lord, opportunities to be bold and courageous and share about the reason we have for this hope. So Lord, we're going into this week, Lord, because you're our boss, you're our master, and we want to serve you well, and we want to glorify you wherever you've placed us. Help us, Lord. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.